midst of this August heat, we have gotten rid of the robes and everything else just to be able to be together, at least virtually. And we are glad that you are joining us this morning. And I hope that you are comfortable and cool wherever you are. Welcome to Port Williams United Baptist Church. I'm Don Flowers, and I have the privilege of serving as the pastor here. I'm joined this morning by a host of other people who will be assisting and leading in worship, not the least of which is Davida DeRoche, who will be leading our sermon. We are especially grateful for the ministry that she has provided with us this summer. After our service today at 11 o'clock Atlantic Daylight Time, we'll be having Sermon Talk Back. We invite you to join us. All the details you can find on our website. As we go through this week, there are opportunities. Remember next Sunday. Next Sunday, we're going to be gathering out outside on our lawn for our Sunday supper together on the lawn. We hope that you will join us there. On Friday, weather permitting, we're going to have a huge yard sale out there on the lawn as well. It's a time for us to empty out parts of our building that have been storing yard sale supplies that had to be canceled from Port Williams Day. This is one of our major fundraisers that helps us supply funds for our partners in Cuba. So we hope that you will join us both by bringing stuff Thursday or Friday to the church or Saturday by coming and getting stuff that you need at your house. You don't know what you need until you come. So wear your mask and come and join us. Again, we are grateful that you have joined us this morning. It's a time for us to be together, at least virtually, but even more a time for us to focus on what is truly important. Time for us to remember our God who calls us together even this day. So welcome. And let us worship our God together.
Our call to worship was written by Sharon Baxter, and it's based on Psalm 105, verses 1 to 4. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. O Lord, our creator and sustainer, we give you thanks. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. O Lord, our Savior and Redeemer, we give you thanks. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. O Lord, our great shepherd, we give you thanks. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. O Lord, our refuge and our strength, we give you thanks. Good morning, everyone. It's time for our children's moment this morning. So please take a second and gather at the screen. This morning, I have a special guest with me because the stories that we hear about Jesus and actually the one about Elijah too are both examples of people who are afraid, who are in situations where they feel afraid. And one of my clearest memories from when I was a little girl um, is every time that I would wake up in the middle of the night, either because I had a bad dream or I was feeling sick, my parents would come in and they would sing me back to sleep. It's one of the most comforting memories of my childhood. There have been a couple moments, even in recent years, where I've needed a serenade to get back to sleep. Um, and it's just, it's a beautiful, soothing, wonderful thing to have someone sing to you. And so I wanted to share a song with you. It's a song called, He Never Sleeps. It was one of my favorites uh, when I was a little girl and when I was afraid. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He never sleeps. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. He never slumbers. He watches me. He watches me. All night and day. All night and day. He never sleeps. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. He never slumbers. He keeps me safe. He keeps me safe. Along the way. story about Peter and the disciples on the boat. They're stuck in the middle of the Sea of Galilee with a big storm and they're just not sure if they're going to make it back to land safely and how long that that's going to take. There are lots of moments in our lives when we're going to find ourselves being scared. And why I love that song, He Never Sleeps, is it reminds me and reminds us that God is always with us, always watching. And so in those moments when you feel afraid, I hope you remember that God is present, that God is abiding with you, even when you're afraid. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful that you are always present with us, that you never sleep, that you never slumber, that you are always watching over us. There are lots of moments these days where it feels like we we need you to be watching over us, to be watching over all the people who are sick, all the nurses and doctors who are caring for them, all the people who are in trouble around the world, all the people who are lonely around the world. And so we pray that you would be near them 
we pray that you would be near us and we pray that you would help us be good companions to one another in our loneliness and sadness and scaredness. In your name we pray, amen. Have a wonderful week, everyone. Our Hebrew scripture this morning comes from the 19th chapter of 1 Kings. Will you hear this word from our Lord? At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks and pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The Lord's Prayer, sometimes otherwise known as the Our Father Prayer, is a standard, a staple in the Christian tradition. And often if you'll recite it in church together, sometimes it's written down, but oftentimes the, the worship leader will just rely on the memory of the congregation. Um, and you'll sometimes hear variations in the phrasing or the words um, around you as you speak it, which is kind of the magic of this prayer. But the interesting thing about this prayer is that if you actually look in the biblical text, so it's in um, Matthew 6 and Luke 11, there are actually two different variations of the Lord's Prayer, even in, in Scripture. Um, and that's not counting the original language um, it was written in, and then all of the various iterations of languages that the Our Father has been translated into um, and is still spoken in today. Um, but the, the cool thing about the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer, is that in that story, Jesus is teaching his uh, disciples how to pray. Although we recite it in the form that it appears in scripture, it's also teaching us a form in which to pray, a model on which to pray. And in our spirituality small group last week, I invited the participants of the study to, to write their own prayer, to write their own liturgy. And one of our members, Connie Vino, um, offered this beautiful reimagined version of the Our Father uh, that we will share with you today in worship. So please join me in the words of this prayer. O Creator God, who dwells in all the universe, may your name be exalted as you reign supreme. May your bidding be done in all the world as it is in your high and holy place. Grant us our daily sustenance and pardon us when we err as we pardon others in their erring. Strengthen us to resist wrongdoing and keep us from dark places. For yours is the perfect dwelling place and the authority and the majesty for all eternity. Amen. Today's gospel lesson is taken from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against him. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. 
So Peter got out of the boat, started to walk on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Let us pray. God, O Holy One, it says in your word that perfect love casts out fear. And so, as we enter into worship today with the fears of this week, the fears of this world on our shoulders, we pray that in your perfect love, our fears might be eased. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you like to go dreaming? Would you like to go free? Would you like to go dreaming? Would you like to go free? Would you like to go anywhere? Why not give it a try? Where would you like to fly? This is the second verse of a song called Why Not Give It a Try. The final track on Gordon Lightfoot's 2020 album called Solo. This song has been rolling around in my brain since I first heard it in April. And I've been wondering why it has been such a meaningful part of my quarantine soundtrack. I think it's all the questions it raises, the choices, the possibilities. After all, where would you like to fly is the kind of question that has infinite answers when you're under lockdown. But I am learning that there is a difference between the possibility of the unknown and the reality of the unknown. It is one thing to imagine skydiving and another thing entirely to step out of a plane at 14,000 feet. It is one thing to dream of walking on the surface of a stormy sea, and another thing entirely to step out of the boat. And it is one thing to dream up new ways of doing worship and of building community, and it is another thing entirely to have to do worship and build community differently because of a global pandemic. We're almost five months into our lockdown, into this changed world that we live in. And as we prepare for this fall, we have so many questions. Can we start to open our provincial borders to other provinces safely? What about our national borders? Can we open our schools safely? What about our childcare centers or our daycare centers? What about our universities, our nursing homes, our churches? The things that we do know feel scary and subject to change. And the things that we don't know, well, they feel scary and subject to change too. And so this morning, I think it is important to say that we are not entertaining the possibility of the unknown. We are living in the reality of the unknown. And gratefully, so are Peter and Elijah in our two texts this morning. Peter and Elijah have the unknown in common, but they have a couple of other things in common as well. In fact, they are two of the Bible's most famous hotheads, I would argue, prone to impulse decisions and consequences that are often of their own making, because their actions and their words are often brave but rash. And it's important to note that in our stories today, both taking on the priests of a powerful queen and stepping out of a boat in the middle of a stormy sea, well, those things require courage. The kind of courage it's best not to think about for too long. Elijah, well, we heard Elijah's story a few weeks ago, if you remember, when Don preached on this same text. But I want to return to Elijah today because I think he has something to say about Peter's story and hopefully about our story. So Elijah is a prophet. And prophets in the Old Testament, like Elijah, like Amos and Isaiah and Jeremiah after him, they're almost like a kind of ancient street performer 
a religious busker who pulls stunts on a street corner to call the people's attention to an important message from God. And I will say that Elijah has some of the most cinematic stunts in the Bible, including his exit on a chariot of fire. But when you're a prophet who pulls stunts like Elijah's, especially when they're directed at powerful people, well, you get into trouble, quite often, as it turns out. And so we meet Elijah in today's text and he's, as he sits in a cave on Mount Horeb. Probably the adrenaline is still draining out of his system. And he's fallen from the height of his triumph into a profound fear for his life. I imagine that Peter was experiencing a similar rush of adrenaline, a similar fear. Peter, after all, was a fisherman, but then he and the other disciples in this story had found themselves caught in a storm in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. The text tells us that the boat was far from land and that the wind was against them. Not ideal circumstances in a storm. And the thing about storms, the thing about dangerous situations, is it's not just that the, the circumstance in the moment is scary, but that this storm unlocks a deeper and more elemental fear, the fear that's connected often to our survival instincts. And if you read through the Hebrew Bible, you might notice that it seems like the Israelites had a pathological fear of water. In Genesis 1, the deep waters are chaotic, and it is only God that brings order to that chaos. In Exodus, the sea swallows the Israelite enemies, Pharaoh and his army. In the story of Jonah, the punishment for a disobedient prophet is being swallowed by a sea monster named Leviathan. And if you read through the Psalms and Job, you'll notice that Leviathan goes on to reappear. This is a people that are concerned with what lurks in the deep, dark places. But before we judge the Israelites too harshly for this primitive fear of the sea, I think a healthy fear of the water is a good thing. In fact, I know it's a good thing. Because for every coastal city that's washed out by a hurricane or a tsunami, for every life that has been lost in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Nova Scotia or on a lake or in a river, we know that water is governed by tides and currents and weather, rules beyond our control that escape our powers. So let me just say this morning that when faced with a death threat or a powerful storm in the middle of a sea or a global pandemic, fear is a reasonable, entirely reasonable response. So what do we find then of God in this fear, in these circumstances? What does God have to say? Well, in 1 Kings, God says nothing. God remains perfectly silent. All of Elijah's stunts, his bold sermons, his personal complaints, his showmanship, all of his words fall away in the sheer silence of God's being. And when God does speak, it is not to dwell on what is past, but to reorient Elijah, to give him his marching orders, to remind Elijah that he is called, that his life is intended to serve the holy and sometimes inscrutable will of God. But the silence of God's presence in this story also reminds us of what God is not. God is not the storm. God is not the political intrigue. God is not the pandemic. And yet, in the midst, at the center of this turmoil, in the silent eye of the storm, God's will and God's very self remain. Back in March, when our classes moved online, my first ever Zoom meeting, imagine that, my first ever Zoom meeting was with Wake's Worship Committee, which is the group of students and faculty who plan our weekly chapel services. We knew that just as we had the responsibility to bring our community into the presence of God when we met in person, we had that same responsibility 
with perhaps higher stakes and a deeper need when our community was meeting remotely. During our first service, which we held live on Zoom, I sat on my computer in the office in my parents' house right here in Wolfville, and I cried while Reverend Alan Suber, a Wake Div alum and now a local pastor, led us in an old hymn using the organ in the church sanctuary where he pastors in North Carolina. Time is filled with swift transition. None on earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. And just hold, hold on to God's unchanging hand. Friends, we have already stepped out onto the surface of the deep. But at every moment when it feels like your foot is going to break the surface of the water, as you begin to sink into the stormy waves, there is an unchanging hand that will reach out to steady your balance and to grab hold of your trembling hand. If I learned anything about leading worship virtually in a pandemic, it is that the old things, the familiar words and songs and stories and voices, will continue to ground us in this new world. But we are also going to need new words and new songs and new stories and new voices to make sense of all the unknowns that are unfolding and engulfing us. In the last verse of Why Not Give It a Try, Gordon Lightfoot sings, Would you like to have liberty? Would you like to behave? Would you like to have liberty? Would you like to behave? Would you like to have all these things? Why not give it a try? Would you like to be brave? Friends, in this storm, our call remains. Our courage is still required, but our hope is unchanged. And so I ask you, would you like to be brave? Thank you again for joining us in worship today. And I want to say a special thank you um, to everyone who helped pull this service together, to Don and Christiane, to our wonderful team of editors, to all of the participants um, who shared their voices with us today in worship. And I want to say a special thank you to Sharon Baxter, who wrote our call to worship, and Connie Vino, who wrote our prayer. Um, it has been a gift um, to share in the gifts of our community this morning. And it's a reminder that even at a distance, we are still creating uh, worship together. And so hear now this benediction. As we go into this new week, remember that you are God's beloved. And that as we, as God's beloved, step into this storm, remember that you have a soul for a compass and a heart for a pair of wings. Amen.